Hi, this is Larry Mantle, host of Air Talk on KPCC. Since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, we've had a daily segment on Air Talk devoted to the latest information about COVID-19. As time's gone on, we've looked at vaccines and how the virus and pandemic have affected the lives of Southern Californians. That includes doctors, nurses, epidemiologists, and other medical professionals fighting the virus on the front lines. In each episode of this podcast, we'll speak with one of our experts on the rotating panel of AirTalk guests. They'll be sharing their expertise with us daily. You can also listen anytime at las.com kpecc.org or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. Joining us from UC San Francisco Medical Center, where he's professor of medicine and noted infectious disease specialist, Dr. Peter Chin Hong. Dr. Chin Hong, a very good Thursday to you. Hope your week's going well. Week is going great, Larry. Uh, Happy Thursday to you also. All right. Well, let's get right into what we're experiencing down here in Southern California. Los Angeles County today put into effect an indoor vaccination requirement that's for nightclubs, lounges, bars, brewery, wineries, distilleries, all have to uh, have proof of vaccination for patrons to go into those indoor spaces and to take part. Next week, I think it's on Monday, the city of Los Angeles uh, has its much wider reaching uh, requirement for vaccination that goes into effect for restaurants, for personal care salons, retail, a wide range of, of other places in addition to what's happening in L.A. County today. Your thoughts on what, if any, effect this is going to have on the spread of COVID? Well, I think, Larry, right now we have moved many areas in California from the yellow category into uh, orange, and many parts are still red in terms of the CDC four-tiered criterion for risk of transmission and community virus. So I think particularly as we approach the winter uh, season, uh, more indoor gatherings, uh, more travel into our area, I I think it's a good move. Um, You know, I think people were worried in San Francisco when we instituted similar mandates that people would uh, not come, but actually uh, it's been bustling, um, you know, wherever I've gone, um, you know, with this kind of mandate in place. It just inspires more confidence in people to actually go out. Speaking of San Francisco, where you are, the city uh, will soon require, and San Francisco is a county as well, of course, will soon require everyone five and older to show proof of vaccinations to eat in restaurants, in theaters, indoor sporting events like Warriors games. Um, so this is this is going to go into effect soon there. Do you think this further ratcheting down, so to speak, with um, vaccination requirement will have an effect? Uh, again, we are, nobody re- really knows what's coming with winter. So I think uh, at least putting the seed or planting the seed into people's minds that this will happen is probably a good thing. Um, again, they didn't make a mandate around that. They were just really anticipating that that will happen, um, giving enough time for kids to get vaccinated. Um, so that's that's on the books for sure. It will make things simpler. Um Rather than having uh, somebody at the door sort of verify age, then after age, then you go down a different algorithm. I think one size uh, fits all might be the best way forward. If you have questions for Dr. Peter Chin Hong, UCSF Medical Center, we're at 866-893-KPECC. Or please ask your question via email, including your location, along with your first name. You can email us at atcomments at kpecc.org. Please ask again that it not be a highly specific question that involves a lot of moving parts for you and and asking for highly specific advice. That's really not the best use of our time and and, uh, not quite fair for our expert to to get into highly specialized sorts of advice. Things, though, that would have general interest and effect, you think, on a significant number of listeners, feel free. We would love to get those questions at atcomments at kpecc.org. Uh, We've gotten word that uh, the new federal requirements uh, for American companies with 100 or more employees, that those employees
always be fully vaccinated. The date for that being implemented is January 4th. And if employees uh, choose not to be vaccinated, they'll have to undergo weekly testing for COVID-19, testing that the federal government says uh, does not obligate the employer to pay for that, that an employer could, of course, pay for that testing, but an employer could could say, we're not going to pay for that, but you still have to be tested, and that financial burden would fall onto the employee. There are also exemptions on medical or religious grounds. This raises the question how some of the smaller companies within this 100 employee plus uh, category, how they might deal with that. How are they how are they going to vet those requests for exemptions um, and 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 all that goes with this with the January 4th requirement? The U.S. Chamber of Commerce and some of their organizations are not happy about the timing of this coming right after the year end holidays and big shopping seasons. They also have concerns about how some of the companies are going to comply with this. Dr. Chen Hong, uh, what's your sense of of this, and and do you think that it is going to be workable for these companies to figure it out? Well, Larry, I think it's a bold step, certainly, by the Biden administration, um, but I don't think all of a sudden on January 4th, a lot of uh, National Guard will be roaming all around checking people's compliance. I think what it is, it's probably going to be a phased-in period, even though they've said the date of January 4th, where, uh, you know, people will be helping companies try to figure out an, a, a workable solution. I know it will be hard for the smaller companies around the 100 employee uh, range. And they there's even talk about even smaller companies, less than 100. But I think people will be helping rather than censoring or sending people or finding people initially. I, and so that's the way I think it will work out. People helping people to troubleshoot. All right. And, and you know, the question, of course, is going to be, too, for companies that say, we're, we're just not going to enforce this. We don't feel like we should have to do it. You know, then the question is going to be, um, you know, what what if any action uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration takes against those companies? Because that that could be a real headache for OSHA to enforce that, Dr. Chin Hong. Yes, exactly. I think the administrative costs of enforcement um, is definitely going to be something that will need to be worked out. But nevertheless, I think the movement in general will get a lot more people vaccinated, which is what we really need. And I know some people are saying, oh, well, aren't we going down in numbers? Uh, again, like I mentioned, we're not really sure what's going to come with winter. Cases are already going up or stalling, at least where I'm living in the Bay Area. Um, cases are rising in, in some of the colder states and the impact of influenza might synergize with COVID in, in, in leading to increased susceptibility. And we haven't had a lot of influenza before. So I think all of these factors, together with, you know, who knows what new variant will come on board, makes us really want to be vigilant against the future, not just the present. Marty in Hollywood says quite a few establishments have been accepting negative COVID tests from the last 72 hours instead of requiring proof of vaccination. That seems like a really low bar as a threshold, 72 hours. Wouldn't it be better for it to be within the past 48 or even 24 hours uh, of a negative COVID uh, result? Uh, I agree. I mean, I think the closer you get to the time when you're showing up on board, uh, the better the test is performing. Uh, certainly two days is better than three days. And some you know, settings, like for example, getting into the United States, I think uh, for when, when we re reopen our borders, it's gonna be 48 hours, not 72 hours. Another alternative is doing rapid testing. Not that it's gonna be sensitive at picking up any RNA, but it's gonna be sensitive to figure out who's infectious in the workplace. So that's pretty easy to implement. Um, in general, it's fast, it's um, on point testing. So I think that's another option that I hope uh, people embrace more regularly. But I agree, 72 hours, a lot can happen uh, in the last 72 hours. And I, I think at those uh, indoor location, um, 
that um, that for the L.A. County uh, requirement that uh, you you cannot show a test result in lieu. I don't believe. I think you've actually. Uh, so the the testing is allowed for mega events like going to a a Rams or a Chargers game, for example. You can show a test in lieu for that kind of a, an outdoor event. But um, my understanding is that's not true. For example, if you're going to get a haircut, you've you've got to show uh, that that you had your COVID vaccination. Eight six six eight nine three KPCC. Doctor Chen Hong, is that what San Francisco does? Yes, definitely. And and coming back to the testing option for companies, of course, the big companies um, is distinct, has distinct requirements from healthcare workers and, and organizations that receive funding from Medicare and Medicaid. Like myself, I think those institutions don't take a testing requirement. You have to be vaccinated uh, to work there. Sarah in Beverly Grove says, I got the Pfizer shot six months ago and I have some underlying issues. I'm now ready for a booster. My doctor recommended Pfizer, but I heard Moderna is 100 micrograms. Pfizer is 30. The increased efficacy makes me want to get Moderna, but I'm nervous that maybe there aren't enough studies about mixing and matching. What do you think, Dr. Chin Hong? Uh, In general, I I think uh, mixing and matching is going to be safe, but rather than think about the efficacy. I think they're all going to be good, uh, regardless of if you get Pfizer Moderna versus J&J, although Pfizer Moderna, at least by antibody response, seems to be a little bit better. We don't have as many clinical outcomes with the comparison. Um, but but in terms of um, the, the mixing and matching data, again, from the UK many, many months ago, when they mix and match AstraZeneca with Pfizer, it seemed to be fine because they had to for pragmatic reasons, and those people are still uh, doing well now. And then the NIH mixing and matching study was a very small study, 50 in each group. Um, seemed that uh, when you mix and match a Pfizer with a Moderna, it was pretty much a wash, but the biggest dramatic results were when you got j and you followed it by um, Moderna, it was like uh, 76 times an increase in antibodies, followed by Pfizer is about 30-something times, and then followed by J&J about four times. So we don't know what those antibody increases mean, um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, I think whatever is available, if it's convenient to you, get it. But if you had a choice, it seems that most people are going for mRNA uh, after a, a previous vaccine or booster. Diego in downtown Los Angeles says, my pediatrician doesn't have a clue when the vaccine will be available for children, even though the shots have been approved. Any word on when I'll be able to vaccinate my kids or where I can go in L.A. to get them shots? Diego, I would start at the Los Angeles County Public Health website because I know the county is going to be very involved in this. L.A. Unified, the school district, has also announced that they are going to be doing uh, at select sites, not every school by any means, but um, regionally spread out at particular schools. They're going to be administering the Pfizer vaccine. They're looking at even having some Saturday clinics at schools and they have some mobile vaccination administration where um, the um, vaccine will come to a school for like a day and provide vaccines there, of course, when parents sign off with their approval. But I would start at the L.A. County Public Health website website to get sort of the 30,000 foot um, view of this. I'd also check LA Unified. Dr. Chin Hong, any other advice to Diego on how to get that information? Yes, no, I think everything you said, Larry, is true. Um, Also, uh, it's supposed to be going to Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid as well. And um, the state also yesterday, yesterday evening announced their own sort of plan to bring everything together. And they also are going to include pop-up clinics, uh, mobile clinics, um, partnerships with after-school programs. So I think they're trying to also get the people who might fall in between the cracks, similar to what we saw in adults. All right. Speaking of kids getting vaccinated, we have a question. Uh, You can explain how the clinical trials for kids were run, uh, particularly with Pfizer, since that's the one that is now approved and available. Yeah, so... um, 
there are three groups of kids in the studies. We, of course, we are focusing now on the five to eleven year olds, but there's also a study with six months to two years and two years to five years. We hope that those results will be at the end of the year. Nevertheless, um, you know, it was a randomized control trial, which meant that uh, half the kids didn't get vaccine and half the kids got vaccine. And there was also a comparator group. Um, so the study was about 2,200 people. And the comparator group was kids aged 18 to 25 and young adults. So they looked at a, a wide range of doses first. And then uh, for the main randomized control trial, used one third the dose uh, in the treatment group and compared it to a treatment group in 18 to 25 year olds with a comparison of side effects. So that's basically how it was done, showing an efficacy for vaccine of about 91% in preve preventing symptomatic infection. Dr. Chenong, we have a question from Lori in Palm Desert. Can anybody get a booster now as long as it's been at least six months since their last dose, or are there still restrictions? There's still restrictions, but it almost applies to almost everyone because you, you self-attest when you get the booster. And of course, I think the, the most important categories are those who are older than 65 and those who are immune compromised. And of course, that means that it may be a fourth dose for some people who are immune compromised because the booster is six months after the third shot, which has been authorized. The second group will be those whose workplace put them at ongoing risk, say you're an essential worker or customer facing or somebody in healthcare that applies to that, that category. And then um, the, the third category is those who are um, have medical comorbidities, including obesity. So I think that it really uh, applies to many people. Um, but again, uh, it's not an emergency, except probably for those over 65 and immune compromise. But if you are traveling for the holidays, and you're eligible, uh, it will help boost your protection against infection and potential transmission. So some people have been thinking about it in that way. And, you know, my experience, and I've just heard this anecdotally, I, I don't have any stats to base this on, but if you go to a pharmacy and it has been more than six months since you got your second mRNA dose, uh, I don't see them grilling anybody. I haven't heard about them grilling anybody. They just allow you to a, a test uh, that that um, you want to get the booster, and they check the timeline of it. So I don't know, Dr. Chenong, what you've heard, but that's that's kind of the feedback I've received. Yeah, I had the similar feedback. It's just honor system. And, you know, I think if you really want the booster, many people would, uh, you know, you could uh, honestly find one of those rec those conditions that fit into your lifestyle. We have Carolyn Beverly Hills. Uh, has there been any movement toward requiring vaccination cards, um, proof of vaccination to fly? And does Dr. Chin Hong think that is likely to happen? I think that may be another step from the Biden administration if these interventions of the mandates that apply to 84 million uh, big companies and small companies, workers, um, don't rep result in, in much movement, although I think it will, um, because the feds uh, control interstate travel, as you know. So the Biden administration can also apply mandates to passengers going in between states. So. It is something they floated around. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of chatter about that recently, uh, but it's certainly uh, something on the table. 866-893-KPECC. Uh, let's see, Zach, in Long Beach, can people get flu shots and a booster shot at the same time? What about other vaccines like tetanus, uh, pneumococcal pneumonia, things like that? Yes, there's no reason why you can't get all of the vaccines at the same time. And Again, it's up to your level of convenience. Um, certainly, if it's really tough for you to get time off from work to go and get a vaccine and you're there, definitely get two at the same time. But if you have time, uh, some people just space them apart just because. Um, but personally, I just like to get them over with, um, even though it'd probably be nice to go back again to Walgreens and get some uh, more chocolate or something like that. <laughs> Mary in West L.A. emailed us, any data regarding transmission of COVID between vaccinated persons? Does it happen? And if so, how frequently? There hasn't been a lot of um, 
uh, data on transmission between vaccinated people. I don't think uh, it happens very, very commonly, um, but it could depending on the context. So, for example, you know, they have been uh, some clusters in, say, still in this year in, in, in singing groups and things like that and fully vaccinated folks. So it just depends on the risk and what's going on, um, but not appreciably on a large population level. Because, again, if you look at the data, you know, we're getting a vaccine is kind of like putting on a lot of masks in terms of protection. So the risk is there, but it's going to be small. So from one vaccinated person to another, it's just a, a very small risk. But if you, you know, are throwing the virus particles at each other, even with a small probability, uh, the, you know, it becomes larger depending on the activity. BJ in Los Angeles emailed us, I have a three and five-year-old. Will I be allowed to go to a restaurant with my family if my youngest is not vaccinated? BJ, it's my understanding that the mandate does not apply to kids. So um, that shouldn't, um, as long as the adults are vaccinated. Uh, And again, uh, this doesn't go into effect with L.A. restaurants until next week. But uh, kids are not uh, included in that. Is that also the case in San Francisco? Dr. Chen Hong? Yes, definitely. And also, I think a lot of families anyway, uh, until the, this recent weather getting colder, have been just dining outdoors uh, as another option. Uh, let's see. We also have um, Rome in Los Feliz emailed us, how can people with a full beard wear a mask properly? Well, that's a great question. Uh, (laughs) I mean, there is a beard mask, believe it or not. And if you Google beard mask, yeah, you can find it. Uh, It's just not very uh, common to get them. Um, There's even like a singing mask. I mean, there are all sorts of customized masks that people may not think about. Um, But the people I know, like work colleagues in the hospital who with very large beards, I remember during the pandemic, unfortunately, they just cut it short or they like decided to just grow extra large mustaches instead. (laughs) All right. Uh, And let's see real quickly, because I know we got a wrap, but um, uh, Kathleen in Northridge emailed, I'm fully vaccinated, tested positive, but am asymptomatic. My quarantine ends Saturday. Should I get a booster in a few weeks uh, at the time that I'm due or take an antibody test in a few weeks? Oh, that's a great question. So um, just uh, the caller got infected after being fully vaccinated yes, yes. with breakthrough infection. Yeah. Tested so positive, think, but asymptomatic. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's hybrid immunity. It's probably, uh, counts as a booster biologically. So I wouldn't worry about it, uh, in terms of not, you know, obviating the booster, but I think I'd probably wait a little bit, you know, you could probably wait two or three months very safely if you really wanted to get the booster, uh, because you may potentially get a little bit more inflammatory effects. The, the, you know, you would, be eligible to get the booster, but the the natural infection uh, together with the vaccine immunity, hybrid immunity, is probably the most powerful of all. We had a listener who said that the L.A. City requirement starts today. Just want to clarify, because it was originally supposed to start today, but because of procedural vote issues, it actually starts, I believe, Monday of next week. Uh, so L.A. City is Monday, despite the fact you had heard that uh, it was there. Even some news organizations were saying it. the L.A. City one started today, but that's that's uh, not accurate. Dr. Chen Ong, thank you very much. As always, have a wonderful rest of the week and terrific weekend. I look forward to speaking with you again next week. Same here, Larry. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of COVID in LA. If you'd like to stay up to date with the latest coronavirus news, you can listen anytime at las.com, at kpecc.org, or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. See you next time and stay safe. I'm Larry Mantle.